the Iliad by Homer in Samuel Butler's translation. Book three. Alexandrus, also called Paris, challenges Menelaus. Helen and Priam view the Achaeans from the wall. The Covenant. Paris and Menelaus fight, and Paris is worsted. Venus carries him off to save him. Scene between him and Helen. When the companies were thus arrayed, each under its own captain, the Trojans advanced as a flight of wildfowl or cranes that scream overhead when rain and winter drive them over the flowing waters of Oceanus to bring death and destruction on the pygmies, and they wrangle in the air as they fly, but the Achaeans march silently in high heart and minded to stand by one another. As when the south wind spreads a curtain of mist upon the mountain tops, bad for shepherds, but better than night for thieves, and a man can see no further than he can throw a stone, even so rose the dust from under their feet as they made all speed over the plain. When they were close up with one another, Alexandrus came forward as champion on the Trojan side. On his shoulders he bore the skin of a panther, his bow and his sword, and he brandished two spears shod with bronze, as a challenge to the bravest of the Achaeans to meet him in single fight. Menelaus saw him thus stride out before the ranks, and was glad as a hungry lion that lights on the carcass of some goat or horned stag, and devours it there and then, though dogs and youths set upon him. Even thus was Menelaus glad when his eyes caught sight of Alexandrus, for he deemed that now he should be revenged. He sprang, therefore, from his chariot, clad in his suit of armour. Alexandrus quailed as he saw Menelaus come forward, and shrank in fear of his life under cover of his men, as one who starts back affrighted, trembling and pale, when he comes suddenly upon a serpent in some mountain glade. Even so did Alexandrus plunge into the throng of Trojan warriors, terror-stricken at the sight of the son of Atreus. Then Hector upbraided him. Paris, said he, evil-hearted Paris, fair to see but woman-mad and false of tongue, would that you had never been born, or that you had died unwed. Better so than live to be disgraced and look to scance at. Will not the Achaeans mock at us and say that we have sent one to champion us who is fair to see, but who has neither wit nor courage? Did you not, such as you are, get your following together and sail beyond the seas? Did you not, from a far country, carry off a lovely woman, wedded among a people of warriors, to bring sorrow upon your father, your city, and your whole country, but joy to your enemies, and hang-dog shamefacedness to yourself? And now can you not dare face Menelaus and learn what manner of man he is, whose wife you have stolen? Where indeed would be your lyre and your love-tricks, your comely locks and your fair favour, when you were lying in the dust before him? The Trojans are a weak-kneed people, or ere this you would have had a shirt of stones for the wrongs you have done them. And Alexandrus answered, Hector, your rebuke is just. You are hard as the axe which a shipwright wields at his work, and cleaves the timber to his liking. As the axe in his hand, so keen is the edge of your scorn. Still, taunt me not with the gifts that golden Venus has given me. They are precious. Let not a man disdain them, for the gods give them where they are minded, and none can have them for the asking. If you would have me do battle with Menelaus, bid the Trojans and Achaeans take their seats, while he and I fight in their midst for Helen and all her wealth. Let him who shall be victorious, and prove to be the better man, take the woman and all she has, to bear them to his home. But let the rest swear a solemn covenant of peace, whereby you Trojans shall stay here in Troy, while the others go home to Argus and the land of the Achaeans. When Hector heard this he was glad, and went about among the Trojan ranks, holding his spear by the middle to keep them back, and they all sat down at his bidding. But the Achaeans still aimed at him with stones and arrows, till Agamemnon shouted to them, saying, Hold, Argives, shoot not, sons of the Achaeans. Hector desires to speak. They ceased taking aim, and were still, whereon Hector spoke. Hear from my mouth, said he, Trojans and Achaeans, the saying of Alexandrus, through whom this quarrel has come about. He bids the Trojans and Achaeans lay their armour upon the ground, while he and Menelaus fight in the midst of you for Helen and all her wealth. 
Let him who shall be victorious and prove to be the better man take the woman and all she has, to bear them to his own home, but let the rest swear to a solemn covenant of peace. Thus he spoke, and they all held their peace till Menelaus of the loud battle cry addressed them. And now, he said, hear me too, for it is I who am the most aggrieved. I deem that the parting of Achaeans and Trojans is at hand, as well it may be, seeing how much they have suffered for my quarrel with Alexandrus and the wrong he did me. Let him who shall die, die, and let the others fight no more. Bring then two lambs, a white ram and a black ewe, for earth and sun, and we will bring a third for Jove. Moreover, you shall bid Priam come, that he may swear to the covenant himself, for his sons are high-handed and ill to trust, and the oaths of Jove must not be transgressed or taken in vain. Young men's minds are light as air, but when an old man comes he looks before and after, deeming that which shall be the fairest upon both sides. The Trojans and Achaeans were glad when they heard this, for they thought that they should now have rest. They backed their chariots toward the ranks, got out of them, and put off their armour, laying it down upon the ground, and the hosts were near to one another, with a little space between them. Hector sent two messengers to the city to bring the lambs and to bid Priam come, while Agamemnon told Talthibius to fetch the other lamb from the ships, and he did as Agamemnon had said. Meanwhile Iris went to Helen in the form of her sister-in-law, wife of the son of Antina, for Helicaion, son of Antina, had married Laodice, the fairest of Priam's daughters. She found her in her own room, working at a great web of purple linen, on which she was embroidering the battles between Trojans and Achaeans, that Mars had made them fight for her sake. Iris then came close up to her and said, Come hither, child, and see the strange doings of the Trojans and Achaeans. Till now they have been warring upon the plain, mad with lust of battle. But now they have left off fighting and are leaning upon their shields, sitting still with their spears planted besides them. Alexandrus and Menelaus are going to fight about yourself, and you are to be the wife of him who is the victor. Thus spoke the goddess, and Helen's heart yearned after her former husband, her city, and her parents. She threw a white mantle over her head and hurried from the room, weeping as she went, not alone, but attended by two of her handmaids, Aethrae, daughter of Pythaeus, and Clymene, and straightway they were at the Scian gates. The two sages, Ucalegon and Antinor, elders of the people, were seated by the Scyan gates, with Priam, Panthous, Thymoetes, Lampus, Clytius, and Hicataion of the race of Mars. These were too old to fight, but they were fluent orators, and sat on the tower like cicadas that chirrup delicately from the boughs of some high tree in the wood. When they saw Helen coming towards the tower, they said softly to one another, Small wonder that Trojans and Achaeans should endure so much and so long for the sake of a woman so marvellously and divinely lovely. Still, fair though she be, let them take her and go, or she will breed sorrow for us and for our children after us. But Priam bade her draw nigh. My child, said he, take your seat in front of me, that you may see your former husband, your kinsmen, and your friends. I lay no blame upon you. It is the gods, not you, who are to blame. It is they that have brought about this terrible war with the Achaeans. Tell me then, who is yonder huge hero so great and goodly? I have seen men taller by a head, but none so comely and so royal. Surely he must be a king. Sir, answered Helen, father of my husband, dear and reverend in my eyes, would that I had chosen death rather than to have come here with your son, far from my bridal chamber, my friends, my darling daughter, and all the companions of my girlhood. But it was not to be, and my lot is one of tears and sorrow. As for your question, the hero of whom you ask is Agamemnon, son of Atreus, a good king and a brave soldier, brother-in-law as surely as that he lives to my abhorred and miserable self." The old man marvelled at him and said, Happy son of Atreus, child of good fortune, I see that the Achaeans are subject to you in great multitudes. When I was in Phrygia I saw much horsemen, the people of Otreus and Migdon, who were camping upon the banks of the river Sangarius. 
I was their ally, and with them, when the Amazons, peers of men, came up against them, but even they were not so many as the Achaeans. The old man next looked upon Ulysses. Tell me, he said, who is that other, shorter by head than Agamemnon, but broader across the chest and shoulders? His armour is laid upon the ground, and he stalks in front of the ranks as if it were some great woolly ram ordering his ewes. And Helen answered, He is Ulysses, a man of great craft, son of Laertes. He was born in rugged Ithaca, and excels in all manner of stratagems and subtle cunning. On this Antina said, Madam, you have spoken truly. Ulysses once came here as an envoy about yourself and Menelaus with him. I received them in my own house, and therefore know both of them by sight and conversation. When they stood up in the presence of the assembled Trojans, Menelaus was the broader shouldered, but when both were seated, Ulysses had the more royal presence. After a time they delivered their message, and the speech of Menelaus ran trippingly on the tongue. He did not say much, for he was a man of few words, but he spoke very clearly and to the point, though he was the younger man of the two. Ulysses, on the other hand, when he rose to speak, was at first silent, and kept his eyes fixed upon the ground. There was no play nor graceful movement of his sceptre. He kept it straight and stiff like a man unpractised in oratory. One might have taken him for a mere churl or simpleton. But when he raised his voice, and the words came driving from his deep chest like winter snow before the wind, then there was none to touch him, and no man thought further of what he looked like. Priam then caught sight of Ajax and asked, who is that great and goodly warrior whose head and broad shoulders tower above the rest of the Argives? That, answered Helen, is huge Ajax, bulwark of the Achaeans, and on the other side of him, among the Cretans, stands Idomeneus, looking like a god, and with the captains of the Cretans round him. Often did Menelaus receive him as a guest in our house when he came visiting us from Crete. I see, moreover, many other Achaeans whose names I could tell you, but there are two whom I can nowhere find, Castor, breaker of horses, and Pollux, the mighty boxer. They are children of my mother, and own brothers to myself. Either they have not left Lacedaemon, or else, though they have brought their ships, they will not show themselves in battle for the shame and disgrace that I have brought upon them. She knew not that both these heroes were already lying under the earth in their own land of Lacedaemon. Meanwhile the heralds were bringing the holy oath-offerings through the city, two lambs and a goatskin of wine, the gift of earth, and Ideas brought the mixing-bowl and the cups of gold. He went up to Priam and said, Son of Laomedon, the princes of the Trojans and Achaeans bid you come down onto the plain, and swear to a solemn covenant. Alexandrus and Menelaus are to fight for Helen in single combat, that she and all her wealth may go with him who is the victor. We are to swear to a solemn covenant of peace, whereby we others shall dwell here in Troy, while the Achaeans return to Argos and the land of the Achaeans. The old man trembled as he heard, but bade his followers yoke the horses, and they made all haste to do so. He mounted the chariot, gathered the reins in his hand, and Antina took his seat beside him. They then drove through the Scian gates onto the plain. When they reached the ranks of the Trojans and Achaeans, they left the chariot, and with measured pace advanced into the space between the hosts. Agamemnon and Ulysses both rose to meet them. The attendants brought on the oath offerings and mixed the wine in the mixing bowls. They poured water over the hands of the chieftains, and the son of Atreus drew the dagger that hung by his sword, and cut wool from the lamb's heads. This the men-servants gave about among the Trojan and Achaean princes, and the son of Atreus lifted up his hands in prayer. Father Jove, he cried, that rulest in Ida, most glorious in power, and thou, O son, that seest and givest ear to all things, earth and rivers, and ye who in the realms below chastise the soul of him that has broken his oath, witness these rites and guard them, that they be not vain. If Alexandrus kills Menelaus, let him keep Helen and all her wealth, while we sail home with our ships. But if Menelaus kills Alexandrus, let the Trojans give back Helen and all that she has. Let them, moreover, pay such fine to the Achaeans as shall be agreed upon, in testimony among those that shall be born hereafter. 
and if Priam and his sons refuse such fine when Alexandrus has fallen, then will I stay here and fight on till I have got satisfaction. As he spoke, he drew his knife across the throats of the victims, and laid them down, gasping and dying upon the ground, for the knife had reft them of their strength. Then they poured wine from the mixing bowl into the cups, and prayed to the everlasting God, saying, Trojans and Achaeans among one another, Jove, most great and glorious, and ye other everlasting gods, grant that the brains of them who shall first sin against their oaths, of them and their children, may be shed upon the ground even as this wine, and let their wives become the slaves of strangers. Thus they prayed, but not as yet would Jove grant them their prayer. Then Priam, descendant of Dardanus, spoke, saying, Hear me, Trojans and Achaeans, I will now go back to the wind-beaten city of Ilius. I dare not with my own eyes witness this fight between my son and Menelaus, for Jove and the other immortals alone know which shall fall. On this he laid the two lambs on his chariot and took his seat. He gathered the reins in his hand, and Antina sat beside him. The two then went back to Ilius. Hector and Ulysses measured the ground and cast lots from a helmet of bronze to see which should take aim first. Meanwhile the two hosts lifted up their hands and prayed, saying, Father Jove, that rulest from Ida, most glorious in power, grant that he who first brought about this war between us may die and enter the house of Hades, while we others remain at peace and abide by our oaths. Great Hector now turned his head aside while he shook the helmet and the lot of Paris flew out first. The others took their several stations, each by his horse and the place where his arms were lying, while Alexandrus, husband of lovely Helen, put on his goodly armour. First he grieved his legs with greaves of good make and fitted with ankle clasps of silver. After this he donned the cuirass of his brother Lacaon and fitted it to his own body. He hung his silver-studded sword of bronze about his shoulders, and then his mighty shield. On his comely head he set his helmet, well wrought, with a crest of horsehair that nodded menacingly above it, and he grasped the redoubtable spear that suited his hands. In like fashion Menelaus also put on his armour. When they had thus armed, each amid his own people, they strode, fierce of aspect, into the open space, and both Trojans and Achaeans were struck with awe as they beheld them. They stood near one another on the measured ground, brandishing their spears, and each furious against the other. Alexandrus aimed first and struck the round shield of the son of Atreus, but the spear did not pierce it, for the shield turned its point. Menelaus next took aim praying to Father Jove as he did so. King Jove, he said, grant me revenge on Alexandrus, who has wronged me. Subdue him under my hand, that in ages yet to come a man may shrink from doing ill deeds in the house of his host. He poised his spear as he spoke, and hurled it at the shield of Alexandrus. Through shield and cuirass it went, and tore the shirt by his flank, but Alexandrus swerved aside and thus saved his life. Then the son of Atreus drew his sword and drove at the projecting part of his helmet, but the sword fell shivered in three or four pieces from his hand, and he cried, looking towards heaven, Father Jove, of all gods thou art the most despiteful. I made sure of my revenge, but the sword has broken in my hand, my spear has been hurled in vain, and I have not killed him. With this he flew at Alexandrus, caught him by the horsehair plume of his helmet, and began dragging him towards the Achaeans. The strap of the helmet that went under his chin was choking him, and Menelaus would have dragged him off to his own great glory had not Jove's daughter Venus been quick to mark and break the strap of oxide, so that the empty helmet came away in his hand. This he flung to his comrades among the Achaeans, and was again springing upon Alexandrus to run him through with a spear, but Venus snatched him up in a moment, as a god can do, hid him under a cloud of darkness, and conveyed him to his own bedchamber. Then she went to call Helen, and found her on a high tower with the Trojan women crowding about her. She took the form of an old woman who used to dress wool for her when she was still in Lacedaemon, and of whom she was very fond. Thus disguised she plucked her by perfumed robe, and said, Come hither, 
Alexandrus says you are to go to the house. He is on his bed in his own room, radiant with beauty and dressed in gorgeous apparel. No one would think he had just come from fighting, but rather that he was going to a dance, or had done dancing, and was sitting down. With these words she moved the heart of Helen to anger. When she marked the beautiful neck of the goddess, her lovely bosom, and sparkling eyes, she marvelled at her and said, Goddess, why do you thus beguile me? Are you going to send me afield still further to some man whom you have taken up in Phrygia or fair Meonia? Menelaus has just vanquished Alexandrus, and is to take my hateful self back with him. You are come here to betray me. Go, sit with Alexandrus yourself. Henceforth be a goddess no longer. Never let your feet carry you back to Olympus. Worry about him, and look after him till he make you his wife, or for the matter of that his slave. But me, I shall not go. I can garnish his bed no longer. I should be a byword among all the women of Troy. Besides, I have trouble on my mind. Venus was very angry and said, Bold hussy, do not provoke me. If you do, I shall leave you to your fate and hate you as much as I have loved you. I will stir up fierce hatred between Trojans and Achaeans, and you shall come to a bad end. At this Helen was frightened. She wrapped her mantle about her and went in silence, following the goddess and unnoticed by the Trojan women. When they came to the house of Alexandrus, the maid-servants set about their work, but Helen went into her own room, and the laughter-loving goddess took a seat and set it for her facing Alexandrus. On this Helen, daughter of Aegis-bearing Jove, sat down, and with eyes askance began to upbraid her husband. "'So you are come from the fight,' said she. "'Would that you had fallen rather by the hand of that brave man who was my husband.' You used to brag that you were a better man with hands and spear than Menelaus. Go then and challenge him again. But I should advise you not to do so, for if you are foolish enough to meet him in single combat, you will soon fall by his spear. And Paris answered, Wife, do not vex me with your reproaches. This time, with the help of Minerva, Menelaus has vanquished me. Another time I may myself be victor, for I too have gods that will stand by me. Come, let us lie down together and make friends. Never yet was I so passionately enamoured of you as at this moment, not even when I first carried you off from Lacedaemon and sailed away with you, not even when I had converse with you upon the couch of love in the island of Cranai was I so enthralled by desire of you as now. On this he led her towards the bed, and his wife went with him. Thus they laid themselves on the bed together, but the son of Atreus strode amongst the throng, looking everywhere for Alexandrus, and no man, neither of the Trojans nor of the allies, could find him. If they had seen him, they were in no mind to hide him, for they all of them hated him as they did death itself. Then Agamemnon, king of men, spoke, saying, Hear me, Trojans, Dardanians, and allies. The victory has been with Menelaus. Therefore give back Helen with all her wealth, and pay such fine as shall be agreed upon, in testimony among them that shall be born hereafter. Thus spoke the son of Atreus, and the Achaeans shouted in applause. End of Book 3 A Quarrel in Olympus Minerva goes down to persuade Pandarus to violate the oath by wounding Menelaus with an arrow. Agamemnon makes a speech and sends for Machaon. He then goes about among his captains and upbraids Ulysses and Sthenelus, who each of them retort fiercely. Diomed checks Sthenelus, and the two hosts engage with great slaughter on either side. Now the gods were sitting with Jove in council upon the golden floor, while Hebe went around pouring out nectar for them to drink. And as they pledged one another in their cups of gold, they looked down upon the town of Troy. The son of Saturn then began to tease Juno, talking at her so as to provoke her. Menelaus, he said, has two good friends among the goddesses, Juno of Argos and Minerva of Alalcomene. But they only sit still and look on, while Venus keeps ever at Alexandrus's side to defend him at any danger. Indeed, she has just rescued him when he made sure that it was all over with him. 
for the victory really did lie with Menelaus. We must consider what we shall do about all this. Shall we set them fighting anew, or make peace between them? If you will agree to this last, Menelaus can take back Helen, and the city of Priam may remain still inhabited. Minerva and Juno muttered their discontents as they sat side by side hatching mischief for the Trojans. Minerva scowled at her father, for she was in a furious passion with him, and said nothing, but Juno could not contain herself. Dread son of Saturn, said she, what, pray, is the meaning of all this? Is my trouble, then, to go for nothing, and the sweat that I have sweated, to say nothing of my horse, while getting the people together against Priam and his children? Do as you will, but we, the other gods, shall not all of us approve your counsel. Jove was angry, and answered, My dear, what harm have Priam and his sons done you, that you are so hotly bent on sacking the city of Ilias? Will nothing do for you, but you must within their walls, and eat Priam raw, with his sons and all the other Trojans to boot? Have it your own way, then, for I would not have this matter become a bone of contention between us. I say further, and I lay my saying to your heart, if ever I want to sack a city belonging to friends of yours, you must not try to stop me. You will have to let me do it, for I am giving in to you sorely against my will. Of all inhabited cities under the sun and stars of heaven, there was none that I so much respected as Ilias with Priam and his whole people. Equitable feasts were never wanting about my altar, nor the savour of burning fat which is honour due to ourselves. My own three favourite cities, answered Juno, are Argos, Sparta, and Mycenae. Sack them whenever you may be displeased with them. I shall not defend them. I shall not care. Even if I did, and tried to say to you, I should take nothing by it, for you are much stronger than I am. But I will not have my own work wasted. I too am a god, and of the same race with yourself. I am Saturn's eldest daughter, and am honourable not on this ground only, but also because I am your wife, and you are king over the gods. Let it be a case, then, of give and take between us, and the rest of the gods will follow our lead. Tell Minerva to go and take part in the fighting at once, and let her contrive that the Trojans shall be the first to break their oaths and set upon the Achaeans. The sire of gods and men heeded her words, and said to Minerva, Go at once to the Trojans and the Achaean host, and contrive that the Trojans shall be the first to break their oaths and set upon the Achaeans. This was what Minerva was already eager to do, so she darted from the topmost summits of Olympus. She shot through the sky as some brilliant meteor which the son of scheming Saturn has sent as a sign to mariners or to some great army, and a fiery train of light follows in its wake. The Trojans and the Achaeans were struck with awe as they beheld, and one would turn to his neighbor and say, Either we shall have a war and din of combat, or Jove the lord of battle will now make peace between us. Thus they did converse. Then Minerva took the form of Laudicus, son of Antenor, and went through the ranks of the Trojans to find Pandarus, the redoubtable son of Lycon. She found him standing among the stalwart heroes who had followed him from the banks of the Aesopus. So she went close to him and said, Brave son of Lycaon, will you do as I tell you? If you dare send an arrow at Menelaus, you will win honor and thanks from all the Trojans, and especially from the prince Alexandrus. He would be the first to requite you very handsomely, if he could see Menelaus mount his funeral pyre, slain by an arrow from your hand. Take your home aim, then, and pray to the Lycian Apollo, the famous archer. Vow that when you get home to your strong city of Zeli, you will offer a hectatome of firstling lambs in his honor. His fool's heart was persuaded, and he took his bow from its case. This bow was made from the horns of a wild ibex, which he had killed as it was bounding from a rock. He had stalked it, and it had fallen as the arrow struck its heart. Its horns were sixteen palms long, and a worker in horn had made them into a bow, smoothing them well down, and giving them tips of gold. When Pandarus had strung his bow, he laid it carefully on the ground, and his brave followers held their shields before him, lest the Achaeans should set upon him before he had shot Menelaus. Then he opened the lid of his quiver, and took out a winged arrow that had not yet been shot fraught with the pangs of death. He laid the arrow on the string, and prayed to Lycian Apollo, the famous archer, vowing that when he got home to his strong city of Zeli, he would offer a hectatome of firstling lambs in his honor. 
He laid the notch of the arrow on the oxide bowstring, and drew both the notch and the string to his breast till the arrow head was near the bow. Then when the bow was arced into a half circle, he let fly, and the bow twanged and the string sang as the arrow flew gladly on over the heads of the throng. But the blessed gods did not forget the O Menelaus, and Jove's daughter, driver of the spoil, was the first to stand before thee to ward off the piercing arrow. She turned it from his skin, as a mother whisks a fly from off her child when it is sleeping sweetly. She guided it to the part where the golden buckles of the belt that pass over his double cuirass were fastened. So the arrow struck the belt that went tightly round him. It went through this and through the cuirass of cunning workmanship. It also pierced the belt beneath it, which he wore next to his skin to keep out darts or arrows. It was this that served him in the best stead. Nevertheless the arrow went through it, and grazed the top of the skin, so that blood began to flow from the wound. As when some woman of Maonia or Caria strains purple dyes on a piece of ivory, that is to be the cheekpiece of a horse, and is to be laid up in the treasure-house, many a knight is fain to bear it, but the king keeps it as an ornament, of which both the horse and the driver may be proud. Even so, O Menelaus, were your shapely thighs and your legs down to your fair ankles stained with blood. When King Agamemnon saw the blood flow from the wound, he was afraid, and so was brave Menelaus himself, till he saw that the barb of the arrow and the thread that bound the arrow head to the shaft were still outside the wound. Then he took heart, but Agamemnon heaved a deep sigh as he held Menelaus's hand in his own, and his comrades made moan in concert. Dear brother, he cried, I have been the death of you in pledging this covenant and letting you come forward as our champion. The Trojans have trampled on their oaths, and have wounded you. Nevertheless, the oath, the blood of lambs, the drinking of offerings, and the right hand of fellowship in which we have put our trust shall not be in vain. If he that rules Olympus fulfill it not here and now, he will yet fulfill it hereafter, and they shall pay dearly with their lives and with their wives and children. The day will surely come when mighty Ilias shall be laid low, with Priam and Priam's people, when the son of Saturn, from his high throne shall overthrow them with his awful aegis in punishment of their present treachery. This shall surely be, but how, Menelaus, shall I mourn you, if it is your lot now to die? I should return to Argos as a byword, for the Achaeans will at once go home. We shall leave Priam and the Trojans the glory of still keeping Helen, and the earth will rot your bones as you lie here at Troy with your purpose not fulfilled. Then shall some braggart Trojan leap upon your tomb, and say, Ever thus may Agamemnon wreak his vengeance. He brought his army in vain, he has gone home to his own lands with empty ships, and has left Menelaus behind him. Thus will one of them say, and may the earth then swallow me. But Menelaus reassured him, and said, Take heart, and do not alarm the people. The arrow has not struck me in a mortal part, for my outer belt of burnished metal first stayed it, and under this my cuirass, and the belt of mail which the bronze myths made me. And Agamemnon answered, I trust, dear Menelaus, that it may be even so, but the surgeon shall examine your wound and lay herbs upon it to relieve your pain. He then said to Talthebius, Talthebius, tell Machaon, son of the great physician Asclepius, to come to see Menelaus immediately. Some Trojan or Lycian archer has wounded him with an arrow to our dismay and to his great victory. Talthebius did as he was told, and went about the host trying to find Machaon. Presently he found standing amid the brave warriors who had followed him from Trachea, whereon he went up to him and said, Son of Asclepius, King Agamemnon says you are to come to see Menelaus immediately. Some Trojan or Lycian archer has wounded him with an arrow, to our dismay and to his great glory. Thus did he speak, and Machaon was moved to go. They passed through the spreading host of the Achaeans, and went on till they came to the place where Menelaus had been wounded, and was lying with the chieftains gathered in a circle round him. Machaon passed into the middle of the ring, and at once drew the arrow from the belt, bending its barb back through the force with which he pulled it out. He undid the burnished belt, and beneath this the cuirass and the belt of mail which the bronze-smiths had made. Then when he had seen the wound, he wiped away the blood, and applied some soothing drugs, which Chiron had given to Asclepius, out of the good will he bore him. While they were busy about Menelaus, 
the Trojans came forward against them, for they had put on their armor and now renewed the fight. You would not have then found Agamemnon asleep, nor cowardly and unwilling to fight, but eager, rather, for the fray. He left his chariot, rich with bronze, and his panting steeds in the charge of Eurymedon, son of Ptolemaeus, the son of Piraeus, and bade him hold them in readiness against the time his limbs should weary of going about and giving orders to so many, for he went among the ranks on foot. When he saw men hasting to the front, he stood by them and cheered them on. Argives, he said, slacken not one whit in your onset. Father Jove will be no helper of liars. The Trojans have been the first to break their oaths and attack us. Therefore they shall be devoured of vultures. We shall take their city and carry off their wives and children in our ships. But he angrily rebuked those he saw shirking and disinclined to fight. Argives, he cried, cowardly miserable creatures, have you no shame that you stand here like frightened fawns who, when they can no longer scud over the plain, huddle together, but show no fight? You are as dazed and spiritless as deer. Would you wait till the Trojans reach the stern of our ships as they lie on the shore, to see whether the son of Saturn will hold his hand over you to protect you? Thus did he go about giving orders among the ranks. Passing through the crowd, he presently came to the Cretans, arming around Idomeneus, who was at their head, fierce as a wild boar, while Myrianes was bringing up battalions that were in the rear. Agamemnon was glad when he saw him, and spoke him fairly. Idomeneus, said he, I treat you with greater distinction than I do any others of the Achaeans, whether in war or in other things or at the table. When the princes are mixing my choicest wines in the mixing bowls, they each of them have a fixed allowance. But your cup is kept always full, like my own, that you may drink whenever you are minded. Go, therefore, into battle, and show yourself the man you have been always proud to be. Idomeneus answered, I will be a trusty comrade, as I promised you from the first I would be. Urge on other Achaeans, that we may join battle at once, for the Trojans have trampled upon their covenants. Death and destruction shall be theirs, seeing they have been the first to break their oaths and attack us. The son of Atreus went on, clad at heart, till he came upon the two Ajaxes arming themselves amid a host of foot soldiers. As when a goat herd, from some high post watches a storm drive over the deep before the west wind. Black as pitch is the offing, and a mighty whirlwind draws towards him, so that he is afraid and drives his flock into a cave. Even thus did the ranks of stalwart youths move in a dark mass to battle under the Ajaxes, horrid with shield and spear. Glad was King Agamemnon when he saw them. No need, he cried, to give orders to such leaders of the Argives as you are for your own selves you spur your men on to fight with might and main. Would by Father Jove, Minerva, and Apollo, that all were so minded as you are, for the city of Priam would then soon fall beneath our hands, and we should sack it. With this he left them, and went onward to Nestor, the facile speaker of the Pylians, who was marshalling his men and urging them on, in company with Pelagon, Alastor, Chromius, Haemon, and Bias, shepherd of his people. He placed his knights, with their chariots and horses, in the front rank, while his foot-soldiers, brave men and many, whom he could trust, were in the rear. The cowards he drove into the middle, that they might fight whether they would or no. He gave his orders to the knights first, bidding them to hold their horse well in hand, so as to avoid confusion. Let no man, he said, relying on his strength or horsemanship, get before the others and engage singly with the Trojans nor yet let him lag behind, or you will weaken your attack. But let each, when he meets an enemy chariot, throw his spear from his own. This be much the best, this is how the men of old took towns and strongholds. In this wise they were minded. Thus did the old man charge them, for he had been in many a fight, and King Agamemnon was glad. I wish, he said to him, that your limbs were as supple and your strength as sure as your judgment is. But age the common enemy of mankind, has laid his hand upon you. Would that it had fallen upon some other, and that you were still young. And Nestor, knight of Gerenae, answered, Son of Atreus, I too would gladly be the man I was when I slew mighty Eriuthalion. But the gods will not give us everything at one and the same time. I was young then, 
and now I am old. Still I can go with my knights, and give them that counsel which old men have a right to give. The wielding of the spear I leave to those who are younger and stronger than myself. Agamemnon went his way rejoicing, and presently found Menestheus, son of Petos, tarrying in his place, and with him were the Athenians, loud of tongue in battle. Near him also tarried cunning Ulysses, with his sturdy Cephalanians round him. They had not yet heard the battle cry, for the ranks of Trojans and Achaeans had only just begun to move, so they were standing still, waiting for some other columns of the Achaeans to attack the Trojans and begin the fighting. When he saw this, Agamemnon rebuked them, and said, Son of Petos, and you other, steeped in cunning, heart of guile, why stand you here cowering and waiting on others? You too should be of all men foremost when there is hard fighting to be done. For you are ever foremost to accept my invitation when we counsellors of the Achaeans are holding feast. You are glad enough then to take your fill of roasted meats and to drink wine as long as you please. Whereas now you would not care though you saw ten columns of Achaeans engage the enemy in front of you. Ulysses glared at him and answered, Son of Atreus, what are you talking about? How can you say that we are slack, when the Achaeans are in full fight with the Trojans? You shall see, if you care to do so, that the father of Telemachus will join the battle with the foremost of them. You are talking idly. When Agamemnon saw that Ulysses was angry, he smiled pleasantly at him, and withdrew his words. Ulysses, said he, noble son of Laertes, excellent in all good counsel, I have neither fault to find nor orders to give you. For I know that your heart is right, and that you and I are of a mind. Enough, I will make you amends for what I have said, and if any ill has now been spoken, may the gods bring it to nothing. He then left them, and went on to others. Presently he saw the son of Tydeus, noble Diomed, standing by his chariot and horses, with Sthenelus the son of Capaneus beside him, whereon he began to upbraid him. Son of Tydeus, he said, why stand you cowering here upon the brink of battle? Tydeus did not shrink thus, but was ever ahead of his men when leading them on against the foe. So at least they say that saw him in battle, for I never set eyes upon him myself. They say that there was no man like him. He came once to Mycenae, not as an enemy, but as a guest, in company with Polynices, to recruit his forces, for they were levying war against the strong city of Thebes and prayed our people for a body of picked men to help him. The men of Mycenae were willing to let them have one, but Jove dissuaded them by showing them unfavorable omens. Tydeus, therefore, and Polynices went their way. When they had got as far as the deep meadowed and rush-grown banks of the Aesopus, the Achaeans sent Tydeus as their envoy, and he found the Cadmians gathered in great number to a banquet in the house of Eteocles. Stranger though he was, he knew no fear on finding himself single-handed amongst so many. He challenged them to contests of all kinds, and in each one of them was he at once victorious, so mightily did Minerva help him. The Cadmians were incensed at his success, and sent a force of fifty youths with two captains, the godlike hero Maon, son of Haemon, and Polyphontes, son of Autophonus, at their head to lie in wait for him on his return journey. But Tydeus slew every man of them, save only Maon, whom he let go in obedience to heaven's omens. Such was Tydeus of Aetolia. His son can talk more glibly, but he cannot fight as his father did. Diomed made no answer, for he was shamed by the rebuke of Agamemnon. But the son of Capaneus took up his words and said, Son of Atreus, tell no lies, for you can speak the truth if you will. We boast ourselves as even better men than our fathers. We took seven-gated Thebes, though the walls were stronger and our men were fewer in number. For we trusted in the omens of gods, and in the help of Jove, whereas they perished through their own sheer folly. Hold not, then, our fathers in like honor with us. Diomed looked sternly at him and said, Hold your peace, my friend, as I bid you. It is not amiss that Agamemnon should urge the Achaeans forward for the glory will be his if we take the city, and his the shame if we are vanquished. Therefore let us acquit ourselves with valor. As he spoke he sprang from his chariot, and his armor rang so fiercely about his body that even a brave man might well have been scared to hear it. 
as when some mighty wave that thunders on the beach when the west wind has lashed it into fury it has reared its head afar and now comes crashing down on the shore it bows its arching crest high over the jagged rocks and spews its salt foam in all directions even so did the serried phalanxes of the danians march steadfastly to battle the chiefs gave orders each to his own people but the men said never a word no man would think it for as huge as the host was it seemed as though there was not a tongue among them so silent were they in their obedience as they marched the armor about their bodies glistened in the sun but the clamor of the trojan ranks was as that of many thousand ewes that stand waiting to be milked in the yard of some rich flock master and bleating incessantly in answer to the bleating of their lambs for they had not one speech nor language but their tongues were diverse and they came from different places these were inspired of Mars, but the others by Minerva, and with them came panic, rout, and strife, whose fury never tires, sister and friend of the murderous Mars, who, from being at first but small in stature, grows till she uprears her head to heaven, though her feet are still on the earth. She it was that went about among them, and flung down discord to the waxing of sorrows, with even hand between them. When they were got together in one place, shield crashed with shield, and spear with spear, in the rage of battle. The bossed shields beat upon one another, and there was a tramp as of a great multitude, death cry and shout of triumph of slain and slayers, and the earth ran red with blood. As torrents swollen with rain course madly down their deep channels, till the angry floods meet in some gorge, and the shepherd on the hillside hears their roaring from afar, even such was the toil and uproar of the hosts as they joined battle. First Atilochus slew an armed warrior of the Trojans, Acepolis, son of Thalesius, fighting in the foremost ranks. He struck at the projecting part of his helmet, and drove his spear into his brow. The point of bronze pierced the bone, and darkness veiled his eyes. Headlong as a tower he fell amid the press of the fighting, and as he dropped King Elethenor, son of Colchidon, and captain of the proud Abantes, began dragging him out of reach of the darts that were falling around him, in haste to strip him of his armor. But his purpose was not for long. Agenor saw him hauling away the body, and smote him in the side with his bronze-shod spear. For as he stooped, his side was left unprotected by his shield, and thus he perished. Then the fighting between Trojans and Achaeans grew furious over his body, and they flew upon each other like wolves, man and man crushing one upon the other. Forthwith Ajax, son of Talamon, slew the fair youth Simoesis, son of Anthemion, whom his mother bore by the banks of the Simois, as she was coming down from Mount Ida, where she had been with her parents to see their flocks. Therefore he was named Simoesius, but he did not live to pay his parents for his rearing, for he was cut off untimely by the spear of mighty Ajax, who struck him in the breast by the right nipple, as he was coming on among the foremost fighters. The spear went right through his shoulder, and he fell as a poplar that has grown straight and tall in a meadow by some mere, and his top is thick with branches. Then the wheelwright lays his axe to its roots, that he may fashion a fellow for the wheel of some goodly chariot, and it lies seasoning by the waterside. In such wise did Ajax fell to earth Simoesius, son of Anthemion, whereon Antiphus, of the gleaming corset, son of Priam, hurled his spear at Ajax from amid the crowd, and missed him. But he hit Lucas, the brave comrade of Ulysses, in the groin, as he was dragging away the body of Simoesius over to the other side. So he fell upon the body, and loosed his hold upon it. Ulysses was furious when he saw Leucus slain, and strode in full armor through the front ranks, till he was quite close. Then he glared round about him, and took aim, and the Trojans fell back as he did so. His dart was not sped in vain, for it struck Damocoon, the bastard son of Priam, who had come to him from Abydos, where he had charge of his father's mares. Ulysses, infuriated by the death of his comrade, hit him with his spear on one temple, and the bronze point came through on the other side of his forehead. Thereon darkness veiled his eyes, and his armor rang, rattling round him as he fell heavily to the ground. Hector, and they that were in front, then gave round, while the Argives raised a shout and drew off the dead, pressing further forward as they did so. But Apollo looked down from Pyrgamus, and called aloud to the Trojans, for he was displeased. Trojans, he cried, rush on the foe, 
and do not let yourselves be thus beaten by the Argives. Their skins are not stone nor iron, that when hit you do them no harm. Moreover Achilles, the son of lovely Thetis, is not fighting, but nursing his anger at the ships. Thus spoke the mighty god, crying to them from the city, while Jove's redoubtable daughter, the Trito-born, went about among the host of the Achaeans, and urged them forward whenever she beheld them slackening. Then fate fell upon Diores, son of Amarynchius, for he was struck by a jagged stone near the ankle of his right leg. He that hurled it was Pyroas, son of Ambrassus, captain of the Thracians, who had come from Enus. The bones in both the tendons were crushed by the pitiless stone. He fell to the ground on his back, and in his death throes stretched out his hand towards his comrades. But Pyroas, who had wounded him, sprang on him and thrust a spear into his belly, so that his bowels came gushing out upon the ground, and darkness veiled his eyes. As he was leaving the body, Thoas of Aetolia struck him in the chest near the nipple, and the point fixed itself in his lungs. Thoas came close up to him, pulled the spear from his chest, and then, drawing his sword, smote him in the middle of the belly, so that he died. But he did not strip him of his armor. For his Thracian comrades, men who wear their hair in tufts upon the top of their head, stood round the body and kept him off with their long spears for all his great stature and valor. So he was driven back. Thus the two corpses lay, stretched on the earth near to one another, and one captain of the Thracians and the other of the Epeans, and many another fell round them. And now no man would have made light of the fighting if he could have gone about among it scatheless and unwounded. With Minerva leading him by the hand, and protecting him from the storm of spears and arrows. For many Trojans and Achaeans on that day lay stretched side by side, face downwards upon the earth. End of Book Four of the Iliad.